Thank you very much. Charismatic leaders exist in many different areas, in politics, in religion, in creative and intellectual fields. Let's begin by looking closely at a charismatic leader in business, an entrepreneur who built the most valuable business of the high-tech era. Steve Jobs was notorious for insulting and cursing out the people who worked for him. How could he generate such loyalty and creativity with such a negative approach? He didn't do it with everyone. Above all, it was his most creative engineering and design teams that he insulted and attacked. This seems even more paradoxical. But notice the interactional details, the emotions, the sequence, the rhythm. Jobs comes in, he criticizes their work, he upsets the whole group with his escalating obscenities, but then he stays and waits for their reaction. Unlike a traditional authoritarian boss, he does not just curse them out, reduce them to resentful silence, and then leave. Jobs stays even for hours to confront their reaction. He's not looking for submission, but for a creative spark. He provokes the team leaders into defending what they're doing. They argue over details. Jobs isn't a technical expert, but he's good at reading their expressions. He can tell when they're just defending their turf and when they have a valid point. He makes them turn the problem around to see if there's a new way of doing it. Having woken everybody up and getting everybody engaged, Steve finds a resolution. Sometimes it's new, sometimes it's what the team has been telling him. No matter, suddenly they're back in sync again and Jobs turns into the cheerleader, telling them they're going to change history, and they believe it. The process of transforming emotions to generate group purpose and energy is the micro-sociological key to charisma. How this works can be explained by the sociological theory of interaction rituals in everyday life. The theory originated with Emil Durkheim, the founder of French sociology, who showed how religious ritual creates group membership. Rituals hold society together and pump up individuals with emotional energy to carry out its ideals. It is the great sociological theory of moral emotions and the antidote to atomistic theories that humans are merely self-interested, rational egotists. The next big step in developing the theory was made by Irving Goffman, who was a Penn professor from 1968 to 82 and developed the theory of interaction rituals in the minute-by-minute encounters of everyday life. What I've added to the theory is to emphasize that interaction rituals can succeed or fail. Sometimes rituals are flat, boring, or even alienating. What makes the difference? Here are the ingredients. A successful ritual brings people together bodily in the same space where they can feel each other's mood and see and hear the expressions they give off. It has to build up a mutual focus of attention everybody paying attention to the same thing and being aware that each other is paying attention. It creates collective consciousness or intersubjectivity. It needs to start with a shared emotion. What emotion it starts with doesn't matter. It can be anger and fear, the emotions that Steve Jobs often launched his encounters with. It can be sadness like a memorial or happiness like a celebration. The key to ritual success is that the emotion is shared and that it builds up as the group perceives they are all feeling it together. Mutual focus and shared emotion feed back into each other. The group falls into a collective rhythm. When rhythmic entrainment builds up, it is the most engrossing thing in human experience, literally the high point in people's lives. One sees this in the most famous style of charismatic leader, like Martin Luther King making a speech to a crowd but it operates on a smaller scale too. Successful rituals, where the focus and the emotion are strong enough, generate feelings of group solidarity and emotional energy in the individual. F failed emotions negate uh, all, all these you know, various points. Lack, lack of a mutual focus of attention, lack of sh shared emotion. Uh, as a result, people are out of sync. As a result of that, no emotional energy and the experience is energy draining rather than energy gaining. Go back and look at how Steve Jobs energized his group. 
He starts with the emotion of shock. His obscene, over-the-top insults get everyone's attention. But he's not insulting them just for the sake of showing who's boss. He goads them into reacting with strong emotions. Anger is good at raising the intensity level, but he keeps it focused on the problem. How are we going to make this perfect breakthrough computer design? Eventually, they settle down into high solidarity, working on the task. At the end, he refocuses attention and tells them how great they're going to be. They feel like they've been in a time warp when they've been in one of Steve's visits. He energizes the group by transforming emotions. Switch now to another charismatic leader, Napoleon Bonaparte. He epitomizes another facet of charisma, the, their tremendous energy. Look at his daily routine. Napoleon got by on four or five hours of sleep, working 12 to 14 hours every day at a stretch, plus a couple of hours when he got up to work in the small hours of the night. He spent no more than 15 minutes at meals and was bored with formalities and polite chit-chat. What energized him was his work. He read reports, sent orders, met with one department after another. He could rapidly sum up each topic, amazing his staff with his memory and grasp of issues, then shift gears to a new delegation. He was famously calm. He used to say he was made out of bronze, listening carefully to what others said, hearing bad news as well as good. When he was with his army in the field, he slept even less. Fifteen minutes snatches here and there. Before battle, he was up all night preparing battle plans, looking into everything while his soldiers slept. How did he do it? Napoleon got an extremely high level of emotional energy from his daily interactions. The incessant round of meetings did not wear him out because they were international successes, energy gainers, not energy drainers. It helped that he was on a roll in France, too. His army was pumped up by an almost unbroken series of successes. In every arena, he and his team were carrying out major reforms. They felt they were doing something heroic. Every encounter during those glory days is intense, focused, and full of forward momentum. Napoleon is at the center of every interaction, the focus of attention that makes him simultaneously hero and symbol for others and makes him even more energized than the people that he energized. The micro-social secret of charisma is that person, the person who sets the rhythm, the person who sets the rhythm of the interaction gets the largest share of the emotion flowing through the group. The feedback loops all ran through Napoleon as they did through Steve Jobs. From this comes the power of charismatic leaders to control others not by threats or promises, but by emotional domination. This mechanism appears universal throughout history. Notice the details of how Julius Caesar puts down an army mutiny. Though the army has been threatening violence against its own officers, Caesar drove straight to the camp without an armed escort and appeared suddenly on the speaker's platform. State your demands, he said. The troops called out, we've been fighting for years, we want to be paid, we want to go home. Without hesitation, Caesar said, I discharge you. Dead silence. Then Caesar said, I'll give you the rewards I promised when I triumph with other troops. The troops began to murmur among themselves, hoping Caesar would make them another offer. Caesar kept silent and started to leave. The soldiers crowded around him, pleading for him to stay, pleading for him to be taken back to the army. Finally, he remounted the platform and announced that he would take them back and wouldn't punish any of, of them. The soldiers started to cheer, but Caesar cut them off. He won't take back his favorite legion, the 10th legion, because they have betrayed me. Now the soldiers are desperate. Finally, Caesar relents and gives the orders to march. Caesar immediately takes the initiative away from the mutineers, and once he has it, he keeps them off balance. His timing is masterful, sudden appearance, unhesitating decision, dramatic silence to let it sink in, a show of vacillating to prolong the tension. Finally, he forgives them generously, but accompanied by another harsh insult, narrowed down to just part of the troops. Caesar gets emotional domination, and he makes sure everybody feels it so badly 
they will give anything to end the confrontation. Shift now to Jesus dealing with another crowd that's threatening violence. You know, you know, some of you, I'm sure, have heard of this in detail, but I want to focus on the rhythm of it. Jesus is sitting in the courtyard of the temple when the Pharisees haul before him a woman taken in adultery. They make her stand in front of the crowd and say to Jesus, the law commands us to stone her to death. What do you say? The text says Jesus does not look up at them, but continues writing in the dust with his finger. Finally, he looks up and says, let whoever is without sin cast the first stone. And he looks down and continues writing in the dust. One by one, the crowd starts to slip away. Finally, Jesus is left with the woman standing before him. In the famous conclusion, has no one condemned you? The woman answers, no one. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and sin no more. I am less concerned here with the message than the method. Jesus is a master of timing. He does not allow people to force them into their rhythm. He perceives what they are attempting to do, their intention beyond the words, and he makes them shift their grounds. Hence, the two crucial periods are the tension-filled silences. First, when he will not directly answer. And second, when he looks down again at his writing after telling them who should cast the first stone, he does not allow the confrontation to focus on himself against the Pharisees. He knows they are testing him. Instead, Jesus looks down, throws it out to their consciences, make them interact with themselves and the woman that they see standing in, in front of them who they, who they are getting ready to kill. He individualizes the crowd, makes them drift off one by one, breaking up the mob mentality, breaking up their group solidarity. Around Jesus, there is only one center of solidarity, himself. In another kind of situation, Jesus puts on the pressure by speeding up the rhythm. When he recruits disciples to follow him, he demands a complete and sudden decision. One potential disciple said to him, First, let me go and bury my father. Jesus replied, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. In a kinship-based society, there is nothing more important than burying your father. Jesus demanded a complete break with existing forms. Extreme emotional domination is typical of charismatic leaders. When Jesus has the focus of attention, he is absolutely decisive. Nothing is allowed to break his rhythm or no hesitating on the part of the audience. Nothing but single-minded focus on the goal. In conflict situations, emotional domination works by attacking the opponent's emotional weak point. Alexander the Great was famous for personally leading his cavalry in an overwhelming charge, but his army was generally much smaller than the armies he fought. Nevertheless, his battles tended to be very one-sided, huge casualties for the losers, light casualties for the winners. How was this possible? Because he aimed at breaking up the army's organization so that the enemy could no longer fight back. Notice the details for the battle. Alexander waited for the moment when he saw the enemy line waver, and then he charged at that point. Micro-internationally, the battle was already over before the two armies clashed. Alexander's army established emotional domination. The enemy's army lost its cohesion and became quite literally a stumbling block for itself and ended up being slaughtered. This is more generally the pattern of all violence, as I've tried to show in my book on microsociology of violence. Emotional domination precedes physical domination and that allows physical damage to happen. Emotional domination is also a central point in business negotiation. Successful entrepreneurs and business empire builders make favorable deals because they know how to choose their targets and the right moment to make an offer. Building a business involves what can be called dangerous networks. Since the same people who are your potential allies are also your potential rivals. This is nicely illustrated by the relationship between Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. 
since sharing technical information and business plans with your uh, developers also creates the possibility of their going off and building a rival business. These kind of relationships are unavoidable in innovative markets. The successful entrepreneur is one who handles dangerous ne negotiations with the maximal amount of emotional domination. By the way, Bill Gates was one person Steve Jobs could not dominate. Gates figured out how he worked on people's emotions and made himself impervious to it. The result was Microsoft almost destroyed Apple. Now, you really need to look, know what to look for to you know, see the significance of this picture. Steve Jobs is famous for this steady, penetrating gaze. He'd stare people in the face. You know, kind of like on the whole, we don't, we don't do this. We do it for a fraction of a second in a flash way. Steve would just stare you down. Bill Gates. Now, at first I think, you know, Bill Gates just kind of, I don't know, maybe he's not, not very charismatic. He's got a different style. I mean, he literally said, I don't allow people to you know, dominate me. He says, when they tune up the emotion, I tune it down. And that's what he's doing in that picture. That's the 1991. Uh, it's around the time when Microsoft is just starting to take over the market. And, and you know, oddly, you know, they're still dealing with each, each, each other. Uh, and Steve's he's putting on that uh, Steve Jobs stare, and it's not working. A constant theme in all these examples is that charismatic leaders are careful observers. They observe their audiences, their enemies, and their followers in micro-sociological detail. Jesus seems to know what people are intending, and that's why he doesn't reply to what they said, but to what they were attempting to do. Steve Jobs is a master of reading the nonverbal signs people give out about their technical competence. All of these leaders read the micro-details of timing. Attention to significant details is what folk culture calls genius. We call someone a genius when we don't understand how they did something. Take, for example, the great mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss. When he was a schoolboy, his teacher gave the class some busy work. Add up all the numbers from 1 to 100. In less than a minute, Gauss walked up to the desk with the answer. How did he do it? Most of us would plod through it. He had 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 3 is 6, 4 plus 6 is 10, and so forth, until 10 minutes later we get the answer. Gauss saw it a different way. He spread out all the numbers in his head and saw this pattern. 1 plus 99 is 100, 2 plus 98 is 100, 3 plus 97 is 100. The top and the bottom, uh, each pair adds up to 100. How many pairs are there? They come together at 49 and 51. There are 49 pairs. 49, you can do this in your head, you know. 49 pairs, 49, it's 4,900. What's left over? The 50 and the 100. Okay, so there's the answer. Later, Gauss wrote out the formula, you know, and actually once you learn that, that formula, you can do it with anything. You can do tremendous amount of arithmetic in your head if you learn the formula. People will think you're a genius. The so-called genius invents techniques. The key is to look at the details closely, to turn the problem around and look at it from another angle, to look at the details, not to plod through them. So, yeah, I'm kind of afraid you know, the devil's in the details. You've got to pay attention to the details. This is kind of like you master the details. Like, what are the key details? Don't let the details master you. They uh, Don't plod through them in the usual procedure. Rearrange them in a new way. Steve Jobs did exactly this when he argued with his product teams. There is an emotional aspect to this. Most people find details boring. That's what keeps them from being a genius. Better put, it, what makes you an outsider? Being bored makes you an outsider. Successful people are never bored. For them, details are not boring because they have trajectory. That's why Steve Jobs could get so emotional about the design of a computer case. So-called geniuses, people who create important new lines of thought and action, are described in my research on intellectual networks as energy stars. They are energized by their work. Their work energizes them because it has a trajectory expanding into the future. The sociologist Dan Chambliss found this in studying championship athletes. Winners enjoy practicing. He was study, studying the uh, uh, Olympic swimming team. They like what they're doing. That is why they spend long hours doing what other people find tedious. Practice gets them high. It feel, feeds their emotional energy. How do they keep it from being boring? You aren't just practicing details in your mind 
These are the difference between winning and losing. You're not just plodding through practice like it's a punishment. You are actively mastering the details, creating your own rhythm, your momentum towards success. Successful people, charismatic leaders, looked at microsociologically. Their common denominator is that they have techniques for generating very high levels of emotional energy. Uh, EE, emotional energy, is simultaneously physical, mental, and social. Persons with high EE are extremely hard workers, but it's not a grind. It's what they like doing. Persons with high EE are confident, enthusiastic, and proactive. Persons with low emotional energy are depressed and passive. And persons with high EE interact acutely with the people around them. They are hyper aware of when the social interaction is successful or a failure. They can tell when people are focused or scattered, when there is a shared emotion and a rising rhythm, or when it is out of sync. High EE person make their lives into a series of successful interaction rituals. And they know how to put themselves in the center of them. High emotional energy is an ongoing social product. You can't just create it by repeating mantras to yourself. Always try harder, never give up. Both winning and losing teams have the same slogans. And lots of people who try to psych themselves up fail. High emotional energy depends on a chain of successful interaction rituals. This means getting into interactions that are energy gainers and avoiding the ones that are energy drainers. Persons like Napoleon got themselves into the center of a network where big things were happening. He became the nexus for a while of all the major networks, being energized by them, by each one of them, while keeping each one focused on moving forward. Being in the center of networks engaged in major self social transformation is a formula for generating huge amounts of emotional energy in yourself. If an individual can focus it and keep it flowing, that individual becomes charismatic. To underline the, the key mechanism, uh, studies by CEOs and other top organizational leaders show that their days are crowded with one meeting after another. So, okay, Napoleon's not all that different. They have a lot of meetings. Here's the difference. Uh, many of these CEOs, organization heads, don't find it ener very energizing. It can be wearing. So they want to take a break to unwind and re-energize themselves. So a lot of the work psychology literature says, OK, you got to find time to break. Put it all aside. Don't, don't get involved in it. This is not true of really charismatic leaders. They get their emotional energy from all their encounters. And they do that by cutting short the ones that are energy drainers. Steve Jobs was a, an expert at that. He had an acute sense of what people were dynamic and which ones were not. He called the energy losing people bozos, and he tried to avoid them. He might curse and argue with the dynamic ones, but they were his emotional battery, and they were hers. The bozos were just a drainer. He didn't want anything to do with them. I will end with two natural experiments presented by history. One of them is the rise and fall of Napoleon. He was alert, intense, and hardworking as a young officer dedicated to his artillery, taking not naps, lying on top of the cannon. He grew steadily more energetic as he moved into the center of the networks where the action was happening. The Napoleon who worked 16-hour days and stayed up all night before battle was both a quiet tornado of energy on, on campaign. Remember, he's not a shouter. Uh, the, and an incisive leader for all the networks of government and social reforms. His networks energized him and vice versa. Eventually, the pace of reform slowed down. Formalities took over. Only on the battlefield did Napoleon find some of the old energy still gen generated. It's probably why he you know, couldn't avoid going on fighting, even doing stupid things like invading Russia. It's like, you know, where's my energy? It's on the battlefield. I'm kind of losing it here in Paris. The enemies caught up. It's kind of like, you know, you know businesses in that kind of frame of the time when you're out in front. Opposing armies imitated French techniques. Napoleon was defeated, finally, at age 45 and sent into exile in a remote outpost where there was nothing to do. His energy drained away. He grew fat and lethargic. Without his energizing networks, he lost his emotional energy. Without a future trajectory, he died age 51.
the second natural experiment comes to mind. The second natural experiment comes to mind from a question that some of you are probably thinking. All the charismatic leaders I've discussed are men. Where are the women charismatic leaders? The blunt answer is that there are not many charismatic women in past history. There is a sociological reason for this, and it is an optimistic one. The key mechanism for producing charisma is being at the center of attention of successful interaction rituals. The charismatic leader lives in the midst of encounters with a strong mutual focus of attention and shared emotion, ramped up by feedback loops of rhythmic entrainment. The leader sets the micro rhythm of the group and thereby becomes a symbol for its members and an emotional energy star, you know, in other words, a charismatic leader. Until recently, women have rarely been at the center of attention in emotionally intense groups. When they were, for example, the, qu qu the court of Queen Elizabeth I, they were the center of ceremony, but they did not set the rhythm. They had formal centrality but not emotional dominance. And so our second natural experiment, the life of Eleanor Roosevelt. She was a shy person, rather private and intellectual, but when her husband, Franklin Roosevelt, became president, he was badly incapacitated and bound to a wheelchair, which he did not like to display in public. Eleanor was delegated all the outreach tasks of a busy politician, visiting factories, Workers, farms, mines, making speeches to far front group. She became charismatic in her own right. At first she was helped by the glow of FDR's own charisma, but she soon acquired her own identity. She, since she was further left on social issues, and especially desegregation. During the Roosevelt administration, she became by far the most famous and influential first lady ever. After FDR's death, she continued for years as the great charismatic leader, not only the continuer of the New Deal, but the standard bearer for new causes. Eleanor Roosevelt is the obverse case from Napoleon. When the conditions for being at the center of intense interaction rituals disappeared, Napoleon lost his emotional energy. When the conditions for being at the center of an endless stream of such interactions arose for Eleanor Roosevelt, she acquired all the facets of high EE, tireless physical energy, confidence, setting directions for others, and inspiring movements with enthusiasm. These examples show, by the way, that being charismatic is not just being a noisy extrovert. The bottleneck for women's charisma is breaking, it is breaking into the center where the attention is focused and rhythms are set. As the bottleneck is broken, the rise of charismatic women is predictable. In closing, one last piece of evidence on the dynamics of emotional energy. A marathon coach gave this advice on not being able to sleep the night before the race. You think you're going to be exhausted because you didn't get enough sleep. It's really the other way around. The reason you can't sleep is because you're so full of energy. Just go with it. The same was expressed by Lafitte Pinquet, then, at that time, the all-time winning jockey in horse racing. I go without sleep for days and it doesn't bother me. I don't know why they say you need a good night's sleep. I don't. I always feel good. I'm up all night reading and watching TV. One reason he was so pumped up was he rode almost 10,000 horses to victory. Winning is better than sleep. And uh, uh, finally, I'm sorry, if you want more detail on this, uh, this is a, uh, a very recently uh, com uh, completed book uh, that uh, you can uh, look up on this link and you know, find out more about uh, the evidence of the microsociology of charismatic leaders. Thank you for your attention. All right, so we've got um, 20 minutes for uh, questions. Um, please, lady, back here. Listening to your talk was that lots of what you describe, the characteristics you describe of a charismatic leader also fits some psychopaths. 
could you comment further about that? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, right, so is, is being charismatic leader similar to being in a manic uh, phase of a you know, you know, cyclic uh, disorder? Uh, if we look uh, closely at people who are in a uh, you know, manic uh, phase, and actually Irving Goffman you know, uh, has a you know, case study, in fact, it was of his first wife, uh, uh, who, who went through, through this. And uh, so you get this pattern of somebody with, uh, at a certain point, they have a tremendous amount of energy, right? But if you look at it closely, they're not very closely in sync with other people. It's kind of like they bubble the energy all over other people. You know, whereas uh, the, the uh, charismatic leaders are actually real good at observing other people in a way that you know, manics are not at all good at that. At that. So you know, I think if we look at it closely, we've got a differentiating point. Referring to psychopaths. Uh, okay. I mean, so people who just manipulate others' emotions? Yes. Yeah, all right. Well, okay, so uh, Steve Jobs is a psychopath. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually just thinking aloud, right? The, uh, how, how can we tell? Yes. Okay. All right. Now, I would actually make an answer about that, about the size of the networks. You know, so on the whole, the, yeah, no doubt Charlie Manson would be another person of that, of that sort. But what they're leading their network to do is basically to cut themselves off from all the other networks. And the ones who are the successful charismatic leaders expand their networks. And so they're kind of dedicated to we expand the network, make, make it uh, bigger. So Charlie Manson he thought he was Jesus, but uh, yeah, I'm not at all clear to me that his micro techniques were the same. I actually know more about Jesus because I've looked at every instance in the Gospels where he interacts with people, and that pattern is kind of overwhelming. He's, he he kind of jumps he jumps ahead. He doesn't answer people's question because he kind of perceives, what's the speech act? What are they getting at here? And they kind of jump ahead. And furthermore, he wants to get the rhythm on them, and so that he'll throw them a question, throw people a question that was kind of, the relevant thing, but it's not what they ask. But he's like, he's not going to answer your question. He's going to kind of uh, throw something at your intention. So I, uh, I'm confident, although we need to prove this in micro detail, that we can find the, the differences between you know, manics and psychopaths and people who are uh, constructive uh, charismatic leaders. Yes, uh, this lady here. Some of the vocabulary that I heard in your in your talk, and thank you for your talk, by the way, was um, pretty aggressive in talking about domination yep. and enemies. I'm wondering if there is space for qualities such as empathy and compassion, charismatic leaders, and if so, how does that fit in together? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, what what I've been doing is you know a series of case studies of people that are you know. Uh, considered to be you know, sort of overwhelmingly charismatic, and so you kind of take what you get. And so you, you get a fair number of you know, these military leaders. So there's clearly enough a pattern there of uh, both being very aggressive, and particularly that's the part of it that I didn't realize at first, but it's actually being perceptive and see where's the weak point. So don't just batter your head against the strong point, find the weak point. So they actually have to be more perceptive than you think. The carryover from that to business, I think, is actually pretty clear. In a certain sense, business entrepreneurship is a lot like war. But uh, at the same time, you got to have your loyal team. So you got to have a technique for dealing with your team and a technique of dealing with your enemies. And then there's that real tricky trade-off that I've called dangerous networks. I mean, there's uh, the idea of networks has been very popular for 10 or 15 years now. And the business world is just kind of full of this. You do networking. Well, OK. There are different kinds of networks, and some networks are just support networks, and some networks are actually not worth very much. They kind of they give you a little support, but they're not doing much for you. The really good ones are the ones where I call them heavyweight networks, where the person over there actually has something serious to offer. The reason they're dealing with you is because they're thinking, of, hmm, maybe that person has something to offer, and can I get it? So, you know, so the same person who can be your ally is also the person who can steal your business secrets. You know, that's a, a famous exchange between. Uh, 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 Steve Jobs and Bill Gates basically over the um, 
you know, graphics oriented uh, user interface on your computer. Uh, the, uh, you know, the whole device of, of instead of just having, uh, you know, words on the screen, the, you know, the, the icons and, you know, the touch, click, and drag, and so forth, all that stuff, you know, they, and they both knew that each other were, were d doing it, but Jobs actually, his technical people were ahead, but he needed, he needed Gates to work with him. Right. Well, anyway, so emotional domination does seem to be a crucial thing in there. Can you have fields where people aren't being emotionally dominant? Well, if, if, I, if we can expand that to mean uh, where you're sort of, yeah, lead, leading by having more emotional energy and more trajectory than other people um, so that it doesn't feel like you're, you're dominating. Uh, I think that, do, that does exist. Interestingly enough, I didn't find it in Jesus. Jesus turned out to be a tougher character than I thought. I mean, literally, that stuff like, you know, let the dead bury the dead. Come, you know, either you're with me or forget it. They, I mean, that's, he's preaching this message of compassion, but at the same time, the way he deals with his followers is, is real tough. Um, do you find people who have kind of the soft, generous form of charisma? Yes, I think you do, actually. Uh, the... Um, I think you find it more in the intellectual world and the artistic world where in effect what you're really trying to do is impress people that, you know, follow this pathway. This is a great breakthrough, you know, do this, you know, and uh, so, so I think it is, it is possible. Uh, sir. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, during his lifetime, there were a lot of critics of Gandhi who says, you know, this guy, they accused him of being egotistical and sort of overly tough, right? The, uh, and uh, I, I, ha I haven't analyzed this, this in, in detail. He did have a technique for you know, organizing a political movement in a fashion that would put the moral blame on the other side for whatever casually has uh, happened. Uh, at the same time, on the micro level, it's quite clear he never really, anybody dominated him you know, personally. You know, so he had that, that characteristic. And that is something that sometimes will rub people the wrong way. It's like, you get the reputation of being, being egotistical. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for your presentation. I wish if you would have left Jesus out of your, uh, out of your uh, inferring what, what charisma is, because now we have factual and biographical contradiction that gave. If, because if we use Jesus as a, as a quintessence for what charisma is, now all those other people are not charismatic at all. And if we use those people as, as to, 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 to infer what, what charismatic leadership is, now Jesus will fall out of what charismatic is because Jesus is the only one who told his follower, love your enemy uh, and turn your cheek. And he's the only one who had his follower sign up contract for life. He told him freely you have been given, freely give. Well. I don't like that as a research strategy, actually. You know, it's, I, I, I think the, you know, the best way to proceed is, um, you know, find your examples. We're kind of finding them as sort of a fuzzy set at first, right? And then we'll kind of, uh, uh, you know, home in on them. And I've, um, I'm working towards a you know, larger theory of charisma, which I argue there are at least three different things that charisma refers to. Sometimes they all uh, overlap. So one of them is what I call personal backstage charisma. It's a Goffman term. It means this person's charismatic all the time. You encounter them, you know, at dinner, it doesn't matter where. They're always on. Jesus is like that. He is always on. He's always charismatic. He doesn't have a backstage. Napoleon is actually like that, too. You know, except at the end, he loses his charisma, but he's kind of like, he's always on. Um, I think Steve Jobs is like that. He certainly didn't have a backstage. He's always on. Um, then there's front stage charisma, and this is the kind of people that can make speeches. Now, sometimes that goes along with this other stuff. Napoleon was not a speech maker. Steve Jobs actually is not a speech maker. He, he pioneered these presentations. They were really choreographed. You know, they practiced them for weeks. You know, at this moment you come out and it was all kind of like, you know, flash the new, new computer on the screen, you know, and now the Macintosh talks. And so for S Steve's not a charismatic speaker. He's, um, so, and then you can have people that are kind of, they got the reputation of being charismatic because they could make speeches, but they're not charismatic otherwise. Um, I mean, so like an odd, odd combination. I think Obama's like that. I don't think he's, I have no evidence that he's really charismatic in everyday life. He's charismatic as a speaker. Um, 
And then finally, there's people who just have a reputation. If you're famous, you're charismatic. And uh, it's true, you know, if you're charismatic, you tend to become famous. But the other, there are lots of ways to become famous without being charismatic. My I, a researcher from Switzerland told me, he said, well, okay, Marilyn Monroe is charismatic. And I said, no, Marilyn Monroe is not charismatic, not at all. But she became super famous. You know, they, I'm sorry? Okay, we don't know a lot about the Queen of, Queen of Sheba, but yes, uh, this is sort of like a Max Weber kind of a category uh, where institutionalized royalty uh, in traditional societies are really trying to put on this show of impressiveness. Uh, and, but, that's, but backstage, they aren't necessarily that impressive. Oh yes, I'll give you an example of somebody who's actually he's impressive in public, but not in private. That's actually Alexander the Great. You know, I mean, he kind of, he has his buddies, his drinking buddies, his warriors, and with them, he'll actually, you know, fight with them, and sometimes he kills one of them because, you know, they, they're too informal with each other. When they're out there in combat, though, he is the big leader. But, see, so you get these different combinations. Can you get somebody who's all three of them? Yeah, well, Jesus, right? Jesus is good at all those three, but, but I don't want to say, okay, Jesus is the only one I want to look at. Sir? They made a statement, and they just broke the crowd. Um, I think that's what they just said. Yeah. Okay. So let's add another word to it: the power of focused silence. See, so everybody is focused on it. Uh, the we, we kind of don't mind silence, by which by which we usually mean there's a certain amount of background noise, but it's not bothering us because it's not in our sphere of attention. You get everybody making them all be silent at the same time. People actually start. Uh, you know, twitching, they want some something to happen in it, or let's break up our attention. And Jesus, you know, those examples, but also gave one from Julius Caesar, where they would throw something out, and then they would wait, like, okay, I'm not going to engage with you on this. It's non-negotiable, and right, or I'm not. That's not the thing we're we're going to talk about here. That people get uneasy, and it actually, you know, it's a kind of a real, it's a version of what I call emotional domination because they use the silence, as, the focused silence, as a way of doing it. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, did you look at Teddy Roosevelt in your research? I think of him as a very charismatic president. Yeah, I've thought about, I've thought about Teddy Roosevelt. I would like to, I mean, my method is actually to, once I locate a person, try and get the stuff about the details of their everyday life. I mean, I, I knew that Napoleon had this reputation of not sleeping very much, you know, staying up all night for a battle, but then I ran across a, a source which described his daily life. You know, it's like he gets up at seven, you know, he has meetings for 12 hours, he takes 15 minutes for lunch, you know, and so forth, and he, and he, gets, and he gets bored with court formalities, and then he gets up in the middle of the night, right? See, so I, I'd like to, yeah, Teddy Roosevelt's a good candidate for this, but I want to get the details of how he actually lived his life. Yeah. Yes. Professor Collins, um, I found your um, presentation very intriguing, and I'm naturally an introvert. So um, when one tries to look at being charismatic, it's almost as if all the leaders had some sort of an intuitive understanding of how to look at group behavior, how to see the opportunity to say certain things, and also a lot of it seems practiced. So if one is to begin being mindful of this, what are some of the things one could pay attention to? I think people actually shift from acting like an introvert to acting, I won't exactly say like an extrovert, but like a, a person with a lot of co confidence and even emotional domination or emotional leadership in the situations where they are in good attunement with it. And Eleanor Roosevelt's a wonderful exa example of this. I mean, at first, I mean, she's actually a person that kind of doesn't like interacting with other people very much, you know, except in her family and so forth. But she gradually develops it. Uh, the so you could say this, I mean, there are examples of what you'd call you know, basically introverted charismatic leaders. They kind of, it, it's kind of striking to me about Napoleon. I mean, so early on, he's this kid that gets sent away to military school and he's nine years old and he never comes back home. You know, so uh, and kind of like he's, at the beginning, he's kind of, you know, this, this isolate and he gets picked on because of an Italian accent and so, so forth. And so he's pretty clearly an introvert until he kind of gets his chance, and then he gets better and better at it. You know, the uh, he never did. He never did really like 
you know, like dealing with politicians because like they're all shouting at each other. You know, like I can't handle that situation. But, uh, so actually, I think it's sort of good news for uh, introverts. Uh, a lot of the charismatic people actually were introverts. Hi, I have two questions. One is just kind of for you. Um, do you come across kind of like a real feeling of connection with friends and family and and community people, or are you really sort of people that you don't really see physically physically? I haven't really studied people in the entertainment uh, industries in any great detail. My impression is that when you actually see them other than when they're on stage is often how uncharismatic they are or rather how manipulated the stage thing is, you know? My second question is, um, in the course of your research as a fellow charismatic person, have you come across any people that are really charismatic that you don't know and you're like, oh, I don't know how that could be so. I mean, maybe this guy is great and this guy is terrible and maybe it's just like, you know, besides the obvious ones you would think. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm uh, I'd have to think about that for a moment. I'm actually one that I will throw at you. This person is far from uh, being obscure. It's Francis of Assisi, Saint Saint Francis. He makes this transition from being kind of like, you know, the playboy, the party boy, the rich, rich kid, you know, living with the aristocracy, and then he decides uh, he's gonna, you know, be the most saintly saint. I'm gonna go out and preach the, to to the. the lepers who could be exiled outside of town. You know, it's like, uh, you know, and I think I consider that the beginning of modern social movements, right? You know, it's like the technique of being a social movement. You kind of, uh, it's good to start with, you know, riches and power. If you put, if you can put them into the social movement, you know, it throws them away and it kind of re recaps them. He's one of my favorite people. I don't, uh, I don't know enough about the details of his, the way he interacted with people. Except that he talked to birds, which kind of implies at any rate, you know, he's kind of focusing on things that other people aren't focused on. Yes. Professor, I just got a question. Um, uh, does the sleep relate with these individuals in the sense that uh, since they are not capable naturally of relating emotionally with the population that they're dealing with, do they instead spend time in? Uh, with all of the factors involved so that they can generate those emotional situations um, in order to have a complete control on that specific population. For example, generating a false sense of empathy or generating a false sense of control so that uh, it's already practiced in their mind to an extent because originally they start off to be introverts. So is there, is there a possibility? Which means in this case, if they are generating a false sense of control, for example, Steve Jobs or uh, like in a different situation with Alexander when after he crosses uh, Euphrates around the 320 BC when he's going further east uh, and he's not very successful enough and the army is tiring out, he tries to generate a false sense of empathy in order to keep the army with him because he's tried everything else uh, with his charisma but that does not work out and he eventually dies. I mean, Alexander dies in battle. Yes, five that's years. right. I mean, he is somebody that right. you know, kind of at the end, he, he actually loses charisma over his right. own When own he troops. loses charisma, he, he loses uh, Seleucus Nicator, and uh, consequently, he eventually dies for something with something as small as, I think, malaria. So the question is, is it that when they are generating a false sense of relationship, an emotional relationship, uh, that uh, also amounts to a certain level of psychopathology? Mm -hmm. Is it possible? Um, it, it, does it come in that domain? Because it relates to uh, the question that she asked, and uh, there was another question. So is it that they are creating, well, manufacturing so these emotions in order to relate with them, but the population never realizes that, and uh, they just think of it as a normal situation? All right. Uh, there's s several reasons why charisma can decline. One of them, you can overstretch yourself. You know, I mean, it, it happens famously in the military world, and it can over it happen in business where you, you kind of overstretch yourself and you know, then suddenly it's fl flipped and, and you know, particularly financial markets are like this big uh, you know, cascade of opinion. And when the opinions start turning negative on you, the, your, your, your funds can uh, fl flow away like uh, that. Uh, is, there, is it happening because of pathology? Well, I prefer to think 
kind of in a much more sort of self-constructivist way about when is it that we label something as a pathology and then look at the interactional conditions of what are going on there. It's not to say there's nothing going on. It's just like calling it pathology, I, I think, is an insufficient explanation of, of what we're looking for. Uh, how does um, Alexander's uh, movement collapse? Well, I mean, here's, here's an instance. He's actually kind of still, he's kind of at the dangerous point. He's out there kind of more or less at, I don't know, Samarkand, you know, somewhere in Central Asia. He hasn't gone to India, India yet. And his army has conquered so much stuff that they're laden down. He was famous for having a light baggage train, you know, like we move, our troops move fast, we don't have a bunch of carts, and now we've got all this stuff. And so he looks at it, and now remember, he's, he's kind of a pure charismatic leader. He doesn't really have the capacity of saying, I give you the order, throw that stuff away. So what does he do? He looks at his own baggage cart, and he says, build a fire, and then he starts throwing it in, and he says, burn it up, and suddenly, his other soldiers, oh great, let's burn everything up. And so all these you know, carpets and gold, whatever they've, they've acquired, they start, they have this big potlatch of throwing stuff into the fire. So suddenly he's got his army back, they don't have all this booty and they've got their emotional energy. Then unfortunately, says, okay, great, you know, let's go conquer India. And finally, they're kind of getting the idea of, you know, this man is never gonna stop and we're never gonna get home and then they start mutiny against him, and he goes and sulks in his tent. It's like, I mean, again, it's, he can't sort of give the orders, I'll chop off your head if you don't obey. When he had mutinies, actually, he, he wasn't able to handle them the way Caesar handled them. But the Romans had a lot more discipline, actually. Now the, you know, so, and I do believe that at the end, he makes a mistake bringing his army back. He's got 150,000 men, and they say, we're going to march across the southern desert of Iran. He thinks that he can supply them with water and food by ships but he's miscalculated, the monsoons are going the wrong way, and he, it's like Napoleon coming back from Moscow. He loses like 80% of his troops, and when he gets back, you know, the rest of the troops want to go home. <laughs> and, and, and then he kind of does something a little bit like Caesar, except he doesn't have a good ending. He tells the troops, okay, you want to go home? Goodbye, I'm going to use Persian troops from now, and I don't need Greek troops anymore. And then his, his soldiers kind of, okay, you know, they very upset, you know, please take us back, et cetera. And then they have this big you know, drinking uh, festival, which is typical of him. Um, I actually have a point, you know, in my writings about, about uh, you know, alcohol-induced emotional energy. And it kind of works very briefly, but it works a whole lot better if people have real enthusiasm. And so uh, he and his friends basically drank themselves to death uh, and you know, he had another big expedition he was going to set out on, but, you know, and then they all got sick from various things, from too, too much, much drinking. The, uh, so that's kind of my more, more uh, picture. We shouldn't see charismatic, something that exists for a really long time, because it kind of feeds on its success. Once you hit a plateau, you're not growing anymore, then it's hard to keep so it's, charismatic. It's, it's fairly safe to assume that the leaders themselves have a greater control over that emotion than the population they're dealing with, so that they can modulate it according to their own... Yeah, I mean, on the whole, that's true. I think almost everybody I dealt with lost control at the end. I mean, you can debate about Jesus. You can say, you know, he wanted to get crucified, but nevertheless, he came, he had only a career of about two years. You know, it was kind of up, 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 and then, okay. You know, then he's crucified, then his movement decides we're going to go on anyway. Excellent. Well, okay, uh, so uh, sounds like, you know, it's a little energy in the room, which is good. And thank you for coming.